Howdy, my name is Andy Weir, and to start our discussion on the history of jazz and the civil rights movement, I would first like to start with general history, because to understand the history of jazz is really understanding the history of black Americans. The civil rights movement started in the 1950s with consensus culture. People were scared to criticize the government out of fears of being labeled as a communist, and having their jobs or even lives taken away from them. White people didn't have much to complain about, as there was a high standard of living, and wages were increasing. American culture was being defined in this time period, with mass consumerism and the influx of suburbia. Rigid segregation was still in effect at this time due to Plessy v. Ferguson, until 1954 when the Supreme Court case Brown v. the Board of Education ruled that equal but separate is never equal. This led to most southern schools closing down their schools instead of integrating as a form of resistance to the ruling. The people in the Civil Rights Movement were Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King Jr., and Malcolm X. Black churches also played a huge part by organizing and mobilizing peaceful protests. The TV was also super important because it recorded the water cannons of rubber bullets that were being used to suppress peaceful protests and broadcast the injustices to the North. This led to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibited discrimination in jobs and public places, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which outlawed poll taxes and literacy tests. And it totally didn't work. White people were still 10 times richer than black people, and 50% of black children were poor. It was clear that the government didn't know how to fix the discrimination. This led to a shift in focus from integration to black power, or an empowerment of black people. This shift, along with the increasing amount of riots, scared many white people who shifted their focus mostly to protesting the Vietnam War. The high tension was brought to a point when in 1968 Martin Luther King was assassinated, which led to even more riots. Riots are socially destructive and self-defeating. However, these conditions are the things that cause individuals to feel that they have no alternative to engage in violent rebellions. Riots are the language of the unheard. This is a quote from Martin Luther King Jr., a month before his assassination. He was against the riots, but understood why they were happening. His assassination caused the Civil Rights Act of 1968 to be passed, which most historians claim is the end of the Civil Rights Movement. All right, next we have jazz history from 1954 to 1968. Jazz ceased to cater to popular audiences and instead became solely about the music and the musicians who played it. The subgenres prevalent during this time period were bebop, which I'll discuss more in depth in just a second. Hard bop, which was an extension of bebop music and was coined by journalists and record companies. It was often described by critics and the public as this rollicking, rhythmic feeling music. Cool slash West Coast jazz was developed in Los Angeles and San Francisco and was considered to be a much calmer style than bebop or hard bop. Third Stream, which we all know was coined by Gunther Schuller and was described as a synthesis of classical music and jazz. Free jazz was an experimental approach to jazz improv that attempted to change or break down jazz conventions such as regular tempo, tones, and chord changes. Now let's take a closer look at bebop. Bebop set a strong foundation for the other subgenres I mentioned before. Bebop was also the forerunner or stepping stone towards an increase in self-expression, which during the civil rights movement was critical. Musicians were able to voice their opinion and narrate their experiences through their music. So bebop. Bebop was a style of jazz developed during the early 1940s and was characterized by its sophisticated chord structures, irregular melodies, and flashing speeds. Many said that this style of music was developed by and for virtuosos. Bebop gained popularity among musicians because it allotted improvisational freedoms that big bands simply could not. Significant changes. Bebop required a greater understanding of jazz theory and called for virtuoso technique. It introduced complex instruments, instrumental melodies and phrases to replace the simpler melodies of the big band era. Bebop also introduced complicated chords and rhythms to the rhythm section and developed a cult of serious musicians. Structure. Improv shifted from ornamentation to organized patterns of fast, active melodic lines. These patterns often ended with an abrupt two-note figure that suggested the word bebop or rebop, hence the name of the genre. It is also important to note that bebop was not intended for dancing, but demanded a close listening ear. Bebop also saw changes within the rhythm section. The piano player had an increased chord vocabulary, the bass player walked more often and much faster, and the drummer added complicated patterns that filled the regular beat. Most bebop performances were weighed heavily with solos and with minimum arranging. The emphasis on improv created new melodies from old songs slash eliminated the, melody, the original melody entirely. 
Bebop musicians composed new tunes that minimized the written melody and expanded the time for solos following the standard AABA form that is shown in this chart. To reiterate, it is with this freedom of improv that captured the essence of self-expression and allowed musicians to voice their ideals and experiences that was pivotal during the civil rights movement. Hi, my name is Quinn. I'm gonna be going over a few important jazz artists during the civil rights movement and their contributions. So the first person I'm gonna be talking about is John Coltrane. And John Coltrane is an American jazz saxophonist and composer. He mainly worked in the bebop and hardbop genres during his early career, and he also helped pioneer the use of modes and continued to work in free jazz. John Coltrane helped uh, Martin Luther King by playing at several events related to the civil rights movement. Um, Coltrane and MLK had a mutual respect between each other in their respective field in which uh, Martin Luther King would be the political voice while Coltrane would be almost a spiritual voice th through the music he played at civil rights events. The main important piece uh, written by Coltrane is called Alabama, which um, I'm about to play for you right now. The song was written in November 18th, 1963, and Coltrane didn't talk much about his thoughts on the song, but it's pretty clear that he's playing almost a eulogy for the victims of the bombing at Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> the song you can really hear like a sense of sorrowfulness and mourning within the slow and soft melody and then towards the end you should have heard a crescendo of toms and cymbals that many really believed it represented the human injustice that sparked the civil rights movement and the next person we're talking about is ben branch who was mainly a blues performer and played the saxophone he gained recognition mostly in the memphis blues scene and even recorded with bb king's orchestra Ben was inspired to work for the civil rights movement after hearing MLK's speech at a Baptist church. Ben Branch became the director of the SCLC Operation Breadbasket Orchestra in Chicago, which is an organization dedicated to, dedicated to helping black families and communities. Martin Luther King often had the orchestra play at many civil rights events and rallies. People even began calling Ben Branch the Pied Piper of the civil rights movement. Ben Branch is said to be one of the last people MLK spoke to. Martin Luther King yelled down to Ben from his balcony one night saying, play that song tonight. I want you to play it like you've never played it before in your life in reference to the song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, which is the gospel song that was gonna be performed at the civil rights rally that same night. Martin Luther King was killed just later, just a few minutes after this moment. Ben put together the last request, um, which is a recording by his orchestra a few months after MLK died and it was dedicated to him. Then the last artist I'm going to be talking about is Carl Massey. Um, Carl Massey was an American trumpeter and composer. Many of his works were recorded by this by some of the greatest musicians in the hard pop and bebop era. He also became close friends with John Coltrane while living in Philadelphia in his teens. He became deeply involved in the civil rights movement during the 1960s. Massey shared what was considered a kind of radical political stance at the time, that it was impossible to separate his work from the militant arm of the civil rights movement. Basically, this means he was very adventurous in his music during the civil rights movement and expressed his political stance through music very often. This caused his career to suffer as he had an altercation with an executive at the Blue Note Records um, recording company, which resulted in him being blacklisted from many other major recording companies as well. Carl Massey's biggest work was called the Black Liberation Movement Suite, which was an extended work that consisted of nine movements that was commissioned by the Black Panther Party. It was never actually recorded in its entirety until about 2011. It is one of the gems of jazz extended pieces and some regard it as one of the greatest jazz suites of the 20th century. 
The piece was mainly designed to musically and ideologically express the revolutionary upsurge of the Black liberation struggle in the U.S. during the late 1990s. Okay, guys. So for the last segment of our presentation, I'm going to be talking about prominent songs during the civil rights movement and how jazz artists use their platform to push for equality. All right, so first we're gonna talk about Billie Holiday and her song, Strange Fruit. Um, this song was recorded in 1939. Um, it sold over 1 million copies, so this would make it her best-selling single. And although it was recorded in 1939, this song remained popular and became an anthem for the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Um, the song has a dark, very somber tone. Um, it's a very slow song, so for time purposes, I won't be playing an excerpt for you, but um, I'll read out some of the lyrics for you guys. So is Southern trees bear a strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the root, black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. Um, as I said, this is a very dark song, um, kind of hits you at the core, and it's pretty straightforward, but to keep it short, this song was a metaphor for the lynchings of African Americans in the past. Um, heavily recommend you guys check out the song if you have time. Uh, lastly, we're going to be talking about Pete Seeger. He was an American folk song singer, and although he wasn't African American, he was a social activist that wrote songs for civil rights. Uh, we're going to be talking about his song, We Shall Overcome. Um, it was known as the unofficial anthem for the movement. Uh, and the reason why is because people would gather around and sing it together. And it really gave a sense of community. And I'll play a short segment for you guys. So that's why it was the unofficial anthem for the movement. It might as well have been the anthem. But yeah, everyone would gather around, sing together, and it really raised the morale of people fighting for the rights, you know? And this song actually um, has a very long history. It originated from a song called No More Auction Block for Me. This was a song that was written before the Civil War. And the original lyrics for the song was, I'll overcome someday. Now, um, in 1946, Zopia Horton actually heard this song because striking workers from Charleston, South Carolina, <laughs> Carolina, sorry guys, sang their version of this song and they brought it to Highlander Folk School where Zopia Horton was. So she heard the song and she heard the repeated verse, I'll overcome, right? As I said earlier. And when she heard this, she immediately just fell in love with the song, right? So she loved it so much, she rewrote the song and titled it, We Will Overcome, just to have a bigger sense of community. Uh, the following year, Seeger actually goes to Highlander School, right? And he befriends um, Horton, and Horton shows him the song. He also, you know, falls in love with it, so he rewrites the song and changes it to We Shall Overcome, and that's how we get We Shall Overcome. So that was in 1947, but um, the moment it became, or I guess the moment people considered it to become the anthem for the civil rights movement was in 1960, when Guy Caravan performs the song during a SNCC meeting. And I guess this is where the popularity of the song really picked up. People just started singing it together, you know. And that's We Shall Overcome. <laughs> 